Most of you have already seen five or six of these tapes. And, uh, and this part of our presentation of the spiritual journey concerned uh, the refinement and the development of the centering prayer practice as a way into contemplative prayer. And we also gave some conceptual background to show how this prayer emerges from the sources of the Christian tradition. Uh, we now come to another section of, of roughly six tapes, uh, which we call the human condition. And uh, the reason why we find uh, this important is that as you progress in the practice of centering prayer, one develops the need for a more conceptual background to understand what is happening. And for a Christian, this conceptual background is, is basically the scripture and the great uh, doctrines of our faith, the Trinity, the Incarnation, and grace. At the same time, this, this, uh, this great dogmatic teaching needs to be explained today in the context of contemporary science and human developments, especially psychology. And, and one of the great benefits of contemporary psychology is precisely its uh, uh, precision as, as to what the human condition actually is. So in these tapes, we'll basically be asking ourselves, who are you? Where are you? And, and it's, it's precisely in understanding the human condition the help of revelation, with the help of uh, psychology and the other uh, contemporary sciences like sociology that cast a light on human values, we, we will be understanding exactly what contemplative prayer addresses in the way of an illness, an illness that needs healing. As you know, we all understand by the human condition today pretty much what tradition meant by the consequences of original sin. Now, original sin was never a, 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 the personal fault of any of us. It's attributed to the first parents as the fall. And it's, it's an effort to, to explain what seems to be a pervasive disease in human nature. And, and the most contemporary psychology tends to reinforce this, for what it's worth. Those of you familiar with codependency in this dysfunctional family must be aware that little by little, these psychologists are pushing this disease, or nudging it higher on the ladder of totality. In other words, it used to be 80%, and it was 85, and so on. Now it's moving from 96% to 98% of the population of the West suffers from this uh, disease which is partially congenital, partially social, but which seems to afflict everyone in our culture and probably in other cultures too, depending on where they are in the developmental ladder of consciousness. So one wonders if 98% of people in the West suffer from this disease or pathology, which tends to get worse as you get older, they say, uh, then who are these mysterious 2% who are so exceptionally uh, free from this disease? So what I'm trying to hint is that, that the psychological evidence as it understands the pathology of human nature and its emotional illnesses more clearly through psychological advances is, is coming to almost identical conclusion as, as the doctrine, which is not only in Christian, uh, in the Christian scheme of things, but appears also in Hinduism and Buddhism and other religions as, as a kind of universal illness, disease, limitation, or weakness that afflicts the human family uh, from start to finish. Well, since the spiritual journey addresses the human condition just where it is, then the value of understanding what's wrong with you 
emerges as a fairly important part of everybody's education, whether they go to school or not. This is probably the first thing that we should learn upon reaching any degree of, of uh, logical reflection. Because, so, so what we're going to do in these tapes is to try to make use of the various models of the human condition that are now available as tools to discern the basic pathology of the human condition. In other words, it's as if we were using these models as tests in a diagnostic center, so that the more accurate your diagnosis of the human pathology, the more accurate, the more effective will be the medication. And the medication for emotional problems is, is not just pill, but is psychotherapy. And so uh, the hypothesis that I'm offering really in the spiritual journey, based on trying to bridge both the best developments of psychology and religious experience and the traditional uh, spiritual theology in the Christian system, I'm trying to to enable us by showing several distinct models to get a kind of overall, a more comprehensive view of our illness so that we may then understand what the divine remedy is. And in this perspective, the healing of the spiritual journey and especially of the contemplative dimension of the gospel, which accesses the higher levels of consciousness that are now available to the human beings, it, it is to enable us to have a, a conviction and hence a motivation to submit to the divine therapy, the healing of, of the divine compassion and mercy, and to share that healing with other people who were similarly afflicted so that not only ourselves may be redeemed, but that we might contribute something to the great individual and social ills of our time, and perhaps even to contribute to the further development of, of the human family into, into more synthesized and unifying understanding of the values of being a member of this venerable race. So, uh, in, the, in the first uh, conference on this subject, we'll deal simply with one model, an evolutionary model. Now, it's my conviction that, that no one paradigm or model of the human condition is adequate to, to handle the great complexity of this illness, which is both individual and social. And, and so we're just offering this today one model. And, and then we will move in the tapes that follow into an existential model, which is, which is simply a developmental model based on the evolutionary model. Then we'll look at the, the traditional ascetical uh, model of spiritual theology, which deals with the practice of the virtues and the moderation of the of the excessive drives for emotional happiness that are unrealistic and unattainable and hence produce frustration, anxiety, turmoil, and eventually sometimes violent. And later on in, in the third set, or fourth set of tapes, we look at a philosophical model and then the model of Christian transformation or what might be called the the mystical theology, and, and thus, looking at all these models, we hope to present a comprehensive view of the illness and the healing that the divine therapist proposes, both for ourselves and for the social unit in which we live. And that unit, in our contemporary consciousness, extremely important development, perhaps 
never before realized in human history is that our unit is the entire planet and everybody who lives on it and everything that exists in it. And, and so it, it, it moves, the healing is really a very down-to-earth kind of remedy. It enables us to, to belong to the human family as a whole without the barriers of race, ethnic group, religion, nation, or any barrier, social or whatever. Not that there's not a certain value in each of these levels of human social development, but now they have to give way to a broader vision in which we see the human family as the supreme value of our social consciousness. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the evolutionary model. And wouldn't you have guessed it? Here it is. <laughs> Notice these are levels of developing consciousness. So here we owe a debt of gratitude to the anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians and other scientists in those fields for, for researching tirelessly the, the first flicker of, of the human consciousness as, as the evolutionary process evolved. Now, a, as a Christian, it's important to realize that evolution is a perfectly normal way for God to function, just as, just as easy to evolve uh, from the lowest forms of matter to the highest states of consciousness as it is for him to create everything brand new from stage to stage. So without trying to resolve your conscience on that matter, I'll simply present this paradigm, do with it what you will. So according to the anthropologist then, the first glimmer of human consciousness, scarcely perceptible, probably began somewhere between five and six million years ago when through the evolutionary process or perhaps a little nudge from, from the uh, God's elbow, so to speak, or, or simply a, a nudge of the, of the memory that matter seems to have of its ultimate source, even though it's not conscious, there was a movement towards differentiating human consciousness from the material world and nature and the environment. And this, uh, the anthropologists usually call the eurobaric or the archaic consciousness, meaning the most primitive. But in actual, eurobaric suggests, it's a term meaning reptile, the, the cycle, the endless cycle or circular motion of events as it's experienced by animals or human beings immersed in nature, such as the cycle of the seasons, of day and night, of, of desire and gratification, and, and, and of hunger and uh, uh, a good lunch. And so at this level, uh, this first uh, movement of human consciousness is immersed in nature and its concern is primarily with food and shelter, the prompt fulfillment of its needs, and uh, concern to survive a day at a time. There's no future for this level of consciousness. In fact, there is no self-consciousness. There is simply the carrying out of the movement of the instinctual needs of nature with a, a, an enormous amount of delight and gratification in the good things that this beautiful earth provides for each level of, of life. Although that provision is not absolute because in the mystery of creation there is both wonderful things and the end of wonderful things. There is both life and death. And, and one of the great mysteries of the highest consciousness is how life and death finally merge into a single unit in which all the apparent opposites are resolved. 
in a unity that transcends both. How that happens, I leave to your experience. In any case, so much for this Eurobaric consciousness, and it uh, lasted almost five million years, and then along came uh, another little nudge of the creative movement of God, however you perceive this, and, and a typhonic consciousness emerged, which was the emergence of a, of a body self from nature. This is the first really uh, significant distinction of self-identity. But again, the self-consciousness is extremely limited, and the typhon, which really means half human, half animal, is still immersed in, in nature and the instinctual concerns and anxieties of the Eurobaric level, which is about food and drink and survival on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and this emerged about 200,000 BC, according to the contemporary calculations. At, and that consciousness lasted for almost 200,000 years also. So notice how slowly consciousness is, is moving, how, how uh, long a periods of time in which this kind of, of, of half animal or immersion in animal uh, instincts was part of the human experience. Uh, the typhonic uh, consciousness is characterized by, by several significant details. One is the inability to distinguish imagination from reality, the difficulty to uh, distinguish the part from the whole. Thus, uh, this is the beginning of, a, of, of tribal culture. There was no stratification of society in the Typhonic level, no, no kings, no wars. There was the hunt. And, and no doubt there was a certain possessiveness, but s on such a moderate scale that the concern for day-to-day -day living and the necessity of the hunt in order to survive, it was a hunting kind of culture, uh, put all the concerns that would later appear out of the imagination uh, of this uh, type of, of people. Well, well, at some point in this long, uh, adaptation of typhonic consciousness in which it's stabilized from the almost totally Im uh, primitive immersion in nature of the aerobic consciousness, the language was invented. Now, maybe this was as much as, as 50,000 BCE. In any case, it naturally accelerated the evolutionary process because of the enormous revolution that uh, 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 easy communication began to provide for ideas and possibilities. And so the mythic membership level of consciousness is identified by anthropologists as emerging somewhere in the, uh, from 12 to 10,000 BC. And this is the development of the city-states, a period of socialization. And the great factor that seemed to bring that about was the discovery of farming. And farming over against hunting means that you now have a, sub, a, a surplus and can plan the future. And some people can have the leisure to give their attention to religious ritual and exercises, to money matters, to planning for the future, to storing up resources, and, and enjoying the possibility of a future. Uh, all of these revolutionary developments in consciousness brought about a gradual stratification of society with kings and nobles and patrons and clients and slaves and, not the least, soldiers. Because once the, the development of possessions and the capacity to trade and to do business and to have land became values that at least the rich people could enjoy, then this obviously needed to be defended. Hence, the institution of the military came into being at this period. And, and, and history now begins to be written and, and moves out of simple 
communication of grunts or whatever our ancestors started off with, to a certain logical thinking. So at the mythic membership level, the first dawn of reasoning is possible, but not abstract ideas, uh, except in very few pioneers of, of further development. But for the general uh, average level of consciousness, the, the logical thinking concerned in, 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 in taking care of the instinctual needs in a way that was more efficient and effective than was possible in a hunting culture where everything depended largely on chance or on the skill of, of, of harmonizing one's plans with the natural cycles of, of the earth. Well, finally, about two or 3,000 BCA, another remarkable revolution of consciousness occurred that is called the mental egoic. And, and so at the mythic membership, there's a distinction of the body self from the environment. And now one's identity comes not so much from nature as from the social unit, moving now from not uh, into tribal interests, but later into city-state concerns and even into empires a little bit later. Now, the mental egoic level of consciousness characterizes the distinction of the mind as separate from the body. And this had great benefits, but also some disadvantages. The reason of the disadvantages being that this level of consciousness suggested the transcendence of reason over these more emotional levels of consciousness. And hence, there was the tendency to repress the seat of those emotions, as well as the emotions themselves, which is the body and also the mythical symbols of the emotional uh, values of earlier stages of human conscious consciousness that came to be symbolized in, 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 in the feminine uh, values of, of caring, concern, nutrition, mothering, etc. And, and that's easy to understand, I imagine, if you remember that in the Eurobaric consciousness, that uh, consciousness is, is, is embraced by the earth or clings to the earth and the soil and nature and the seasons as to a mother's breast. This is all the reality that this level of consciousness knows. And, and so when the mental egoic begins to differentiate from that over-identification of earlier stages, the, the, this tendency to uh, repress as a, as a lesser value these uh, earlier stages of consciousness. There is a further stages of consciousness, the intuitive, which is, which is uh, a beginning to access the spiritual level of our being. And, and, and it may be expressed by psychic gifts, but more importantly, it's expressed by insights into the sense of belonging and, and unity with God and with the universe. And, 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 and the, in, in the view of this evolutionary model, then, it, it, it proceeds beyond the stage in which is the common level of consciousness now into possibilities of growing even further. And it's to those possibilities, of course, that the spiritual journey in all the world religions addresses itself with more or less force or urgency. One of the reasons we are looking at this evolutionary model is the fact that uh, Ken Wilbur, in, in his uh, transpersonal psychology, and has united this evolutionary model with the developmental insights of modern psychology. And, and that insight might be put this way, that each of us, from the time of conception until about 15 or 16, passes through each level of consciousness that the human family as a whole has been through or still lingers in, because not everybody has, has climbed these stages. We still find 
the native peoples, the primitive peoples in New Guinea and elsewhere, who, whose basic culture is still hunting and whose value system is based on a typhonic consciousness with its magical quality and at the same time its closeness to nature. Hence, in many ways, these people intuit the, uh, and are closer to nature with its, with its healing elements than we are because in, in, tr in moving and differentiating our consciousness from the emotional levels that preceded them, we also repress that part of our intuition. And, and so this brings us to another observation of, of Ken Wilbur's, and that is that these uh, developments, when they refer to the human family as a whole, are not a, an uninterrupted development, as you might have suspected, if it took five million years to be, get from the aerobic consciousness uh, with the reptilian mythological symbol of the serpent eating its tail, symbolizing the consciousness of the recycling of everything in nature, including human life, I suppose. They, they, when they uh, move then into the Typhon, which, uh, whose symbol is, is uh, uh, the uh, totem pole or, or the half-human, half-animal beasts of mythology, these levels of consciousness have a true value, and, 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 uh, but the disvalue consists in, in, in the regressive tendencies that are present since since consciousness began immersed in nature, not all of the human family or that group of, huma of humanity that is evolving moves into the next level and may regress and stabilize or go back to lower levels, especially in a crisis of development or transition. And, and that, that means that uh, this, is, this model is a kind of idealized model in which these levels of consciousness are ideal. But in actual fact, as, as each human uh, unit or social unit moves from one to the other over, over time and whatever period they happen to be in in the history of the world, they, they take with them both the values and the limitations of each stage, and sometimes they become fixated in, in the limitations of the previous level of consciousness. And hence, there is not a complete differentiation or a taking up of what was of value in the lower and re-expressing it in, in a more developed level of consciousness. So it, actually, the very words lower and higher are somewhat misleading because each one of these levels of consciousness has a value it's just that evolution seems to have a natural dynamic to move us into further expanded levels of consciousness, whether you want to call these higher or lower. Actually, there are higher potentialities, but in actual fact, they may be lower <laughs> because one does not use them correctly and makes use of the further development of the brain to, to build bigger and better uh, structures to maintain a typhonic level of society. And, and, uh, and so when we consider some of these as, as actually a recapitulation of our own experience, it alerts us to the fact that in our own conscious or subconscious are, are the very values that we can observe the help of anthropologists as the various s movements or stages of human consciousness as it moved from identification with nature to the ultimate self-differentiation of, of the mental egoic period. Now, this uh, differentiation has certain disadvantages. When we were immersed in nature, as a race or in our own individual developmental. And, and found in, in the womb or in mother's arms and breast the oceanic bliss that is, that is uh, 
allegedly characteristic of the first 18 months of life and, and seems to be really true. Uh, you often <laughs> see the, the excitement of the infant in, in discovering something very prosaic like your nose or something interesting or pull your hair or your whiskers. And, and there's a certain awe in the infant that is so delightful. And when it discovers something, it seems to open a, this ocean of bliss and it may giggle and sigh with pleasure so that almost anything can turn on the child. So this suggests that, that this, especially the last five million years, was a hard level to relinquish for human beings when they were, were called by the evolutionary process or by the divine nudge to move a little more. And, and it does seem as though evolution had a certain inevitability, even though everybody doesn't uh, make the integration. Because uh, when you uh, notice the, uh, the beauty of the child and its, and its pleasure in finding all its needs fulfilled by the promptitude of the mother's care, then it, it tends to remain or to be sucked back, so to speak, in that non-identity or no self-consciousness. And it's precisely after eight months or so when mother decides it's time for baby to do a few things for itself or it's not quite so prompt that this ambivalence as to its identification with the mother begins to arise. Now, another transpersonal psychologist, Michael Washburn, has, has used this observation for a, a remarkable insight, which he calls original repression. And, and in this explanation, he sees the child's identification with its mother as, as, as at the same time identification with the ground of being, with the dynamic ground of being, which is supporting its life at every level, especially its polymorphous sensual delight throughout the body in all its experiences that it's accumulating, at least the pleasant ones. And, and so at the same time that the infant decides to set out on, its, on, on a new uh, uh, level of independence, on the differentiating itself from mother, it begins to differentiate itself from its dynamic ground, the source of its being, and it begins to repress that energy. And this is a necessary development if the self is going to develop into an independent and strong ego. And, 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 and this observation then, it uh, seems to me, uh, casts a further light on the evolutionary process and why there is such pain and ache in moving from one level of consciousness to another, and why it should not surprise us that in moving beyond the mythic membership or mental egoic levels, we find this downward tug or the, this pain because of the former identification or the memory in our unconscious of the oceanic bliss or the age of innocence, which was a pre-rational level of consciousness, and hence did not have the sense of responsibility that we bring with us as we pass through our developmental stages from, from the womb to about 15 years of age. So the, there is in us then both the values and the disvalues of each one of these levels. And ideally, the process would involve integrating all that was good at the previous level of consciousness into the new level, which usually provides a higher synthesis and a greater uh, range of awareness and growth. At the same time, if there's a fixation emotionally at one of these early levels, then the fixation is not integrated and then accompanies you through the rest of life as one's uh, intelligence, perhaps spiritual life, physical nature grow. There remains 
the unintegrated value system from one of the previous levels of consciousness that is obviously not only inappropriate, but pr pr introduces a kind of civil war or pathology that is translated into the afflictive emotions of anxiety, turmoil, uncontrollable anger, lust, and, and the other afflictive emotions that we'll be discussing uh, later uh, when we look at the existential model. <laughs>